Jonathan Perry. I currently serve as an assistant dean of community clinical education at California Health Sciences University in Clovis, California. Today, I'm going to be presenting on impulsivity, irritability, and depression in adolescence. I don't have any relevant disclosures. When asked about uh, this topic specifically, it's, it's funny as a speaker, you never know entirely what topic you're going to be asked to present about. And so when I received an email late, or I guess uh, over the summer, requesting to present on this, I thought, why am I being asked to present on this? And I remembered, oh, that's right, as a fellow, as a child and adolescent psychiatry fellow, I'd actually published a textbook chapter and an article on this topic. So some of the information has changed, and I'll be highlighting those, uh, those changes and kind of a modern way of thinking about this. And I'm looking at presenting this topic specifically as intended for a primary care audience, an audience of uh, professional primary care physicians. In terms of our learning objectives today, we're going to be starting with some definitions. We're going to define and describe irritability, impulsivity, and depression. We'll talk about the common diagnoses that are associated with those specific symptoms or behaviors. We'll take a look at the underlying neurobiology in irritability, impulsivity, and depression, followed by looking at some specific treatment approaches. Finally, we'll apply the concepts we've spoken about to specific clinical vignettes. And while doing so, we'll also compare and contrast the mechanisms of action, dosing, adverse effects, toxicity, lab tests, and FDA approvals as they relate to these specific uh, diagnoses, if you will, and or symptoms, as well as the medications used to treat them. So first, let's go ahead and start with some definitions to make sure that we are all on the same page. Impulsivity is something that many of us have probably experienced at some times in our lives, but hopefully not all the time. Impulsivity specifically is characterized by behaviors that reflect little or no clear consideration of the consequences of those behaviors. It's often performed unreflectively, and it can often result in some serious adverse effects both to the affected individual and to others. It's commonly associated with ADHD, conduct disorder, bipolar disorders, cluster B personality disorders, prater willi syndrome, and no surprise, impulse control disorders. So impulsivity in itself is not a diagnosis, but it is a defining feature or a symptom of many of these other diagnoses. Now, if we were to look at the underlying neurobiology of impulsivity, it's been linked uh, to a number of different neurotransmitter symptoms, systems, sorry. So it's been linked with serotonergic dysfunction. Uh, it's also been linked with dopaminergic and noradrenergic functions, particularly in ADHD. Now, it would make sense if we think about the inhibition parts of our brain, the parts that help us to tap the brakes on things, we're often thinking about our higher level functions. So it, it shouldn't surprise us that dysfunction in those frontal temporal areas, perhaps the striatal regions, is associated with abnormalities in executive function, the ability to carry out complex series of tasks, as well as appreciate the consequences of those tasks. When we think about our antidepressant medications, we do know that those interact extensively with those neurotransmitter symptoms and their pharmacologic properties likely do account for some of their ability to curb impulsive behavior. However, we have to remember that antidepressants are more commonly utilized in complex presentations involving mood and anxiety disorders, but we really wanna be careful with our antidepressants if the impulsivity is part of a bipolar disorder. This is a quick review, again, with the intended audience of primary care professionals of our dopamine, nor epinephrine, nor adrenaline, and serotonin systems, specifically that these systems are pervasive throughout the brain. It's not like you could just identify and point to a spot on the map and say, this is where norepinephrine works. It's really much more complex than that. So as we think about our treatments and our diagnoses, we have to remember that many of these different areas might be involved with, uh, with our treatment. This again, just highlights some of the different areas that are involved in, in brain function. And what I really want us to focus on is kind of this anterior part of the brain here on the left, uh, that is the frontal lobe involved with planning, organizing, emotional behavioral control, problem solving, attention, social skills, conscious movement, flexible thinking. Here it's shown on the right, the dorsolateral and orbitofrontal cortices that together compose the prefrontal cortex. Those areas, as we'll come to look at, are impaired in patients who have difficulties with impulsivity, either as a result of some type of uh, developmental concern 
or it can even be something that's acquired where patients who have injuries to these areas can also be associated with uh, more deficits and more problems in impulsivity. In terms of our pharmacotherapy for impulsivity, it really depends on when and where those impulsive actions are shown. So I mentioned, hey, we're thinking about antidepressants many times. However, we have to recall that if we're using ADHD as uh, one of the diagnoses, then which impulsivity is, is uh, pathognomonic, if you will, for one of the types of ADHD, it turns out that our psychostimulants actually help to stimulate the parts of the brain in those same areas that are responsible for inhibition, right? So essentially what we're doing is we're stimulating the brakes in some ways to allow the patient with ADHD to slow down a little bit, to be able to be less impulsive. Likewise, if we're looking at a patient with a manic episode as the, as the key component of bipolar disorder, we're looking at mood stabilizers and or atypical antipsychotics for the way that we might control impulsivity related to a manic episode. So we've laid out different areas, right? If it's related to more of a depressive syndrome, then antidepressants might make sense. Or if it's related to anxiety, antidepressants often make sense. For ADHD, we're really thinking about perhaps stimulants as first-line agent. And then if it's a manic episode or part of a bipolar disorder, we'll be looking at mood stabilizers or atypical antipsychotics. We have to remember with our uh, bipolar disorders, we want to be really careful of, with antidepressants so as not to worsen or induce mania. And I do have, and I've had some of uh, my most awesome med students help to develop these slides, and they want to remind us of these, this uh, mnemonic that we use for a manic episode, the dig faster as different symptoms that are present as part of bipolar disorder or a manic episode. Now, irritability is different than impulsivity. Impulsivity is about that lack of inhibition or perhaps not having the forethought to, uh, to limit oneself from potentially harmful activities. Whereas irritability is really about affect. It's about the mood. It's about a patient having a reduced threshold for anger, for an angry affect with relatively minimal provocation. A person who's irritable might be said to have a, a short fuse. They sort of uh, explode right away. Now, the DSM-5 uh, text revision defines irritable mood as a low threshold to experience anger in response to frustration. And irritability can appear as age-inappropriate temper outbursts, a sullen, grouchy mood. Again, irritability, like impulsivity, it's not a diagnosis in itself, but it can be associated with generalized anxiety disorder, antisocial personality disorder, various withdrawal problems, pathologic gambling. It could be a part of primary thought or psychotic disorders like schizoaffective disorder, and certainly irritability can be a component of major depressive disorder as well. Now, if we look at irritability, uh, a lot of times I'll be simplifying our thoughts on this presentation, thinking about gas pedal and brake pedal, different things that too much of one or the other is, is not good. We really want that happy balance in order for the person to navigate through their life. So similarly as the impulsivity, with irritability, systems have been implicated with serotonin levels as well as dopamine levels and modulation. Now they interact in such a way that if the serotonin system is not, uh, is not functioning appropriately, if it's hypofunctioning, then there might, be in, there might be a loss of modulation of impulsivity or irritability. And dopamine hyperfunction, too much dopamine, can lead to aggressive reactivity. Again, that analogy, too much gas, not enough brake. Now, the anatomic associations here are not just the frontal temporal cortex that we spoke about before that's associated with more executive function, more higher level things, but also really sort of primitive things in the brain, the amygdala, the hypothalamus, parts of our brain that really we share with very simple vertebrates. Uh, for those of us who, <laughs> who have animals, right, I'll often think of my, my I've got a, an 80 pound pound puppy that we adopted about two months ago, and I know he can get irritated. And... Uh, I also know that his frontotemporal cortex, at least in theory, isn't as well developed as many of us in this room. So it's really the amygdala, the hypothalamus, some of these things that are firing a little bit uh, out of sync. It also can be associated with chronic pain syndromes. In particular, we see increased activity in the paraaqueductal gray area. And this region is related to the perception of somatic pain as well as negative emotional states. In one of my talks, I go into some of the functional imaging where we take a look at fMRI or spec scans and we identify how actually negative emotional states, remorse, sadness, grief, 
light up in the brain the same ways that pain is, is registered. I bring back our anatomy here because again, it's, it's really the same systems that we're looking at. And as I tried to make the point earlier, the systems are somewhat pervasive and well networked throughout the brain so that serotonin isn't just located in one spot. It's not just uh, in the middle cere cerebellar peduncle. It's not just in the superior cerebellar peduncle, but it's different places in the brain that then can go ahead and activate different areas. Similarly, the periaqueductal gray is really kind of a, a function of the brainstem here um, that's associated with fears, with post-traumatic stress disorder, with responses of freezing and panic attacks. So it's not uncommon to see a person who has impulsivity might also have irritability, and it might be part of fear syndromes or anxiety or post-traumatic stress disorder. So the way that we address it is by trying to encapsulate the diagnosis and, and address the patient as best as we can to really understand how to treat them individually, even though the symptoms may present across multiple different diagnoses. So in terms of our pharmacotherapy, again, I've put in something here that might be a treatment for irritability. Is uh, I don't know if it would create or uh, solve irritability, but uh, puppies would certainly have some effect. But again, here we have our conditions associated with irritability, our depressive disorders, trauma spectrum disorders, schizophrenia spectrum disorders, disruptive behaviors, autism spectrum disorders, for many of these, for nearly all of these, the irritability responds really well to antidepressant treatment. But again, just as we saw with impulsivity, we need to be cautious in the setting of bipolar disorders. Specifically in that sense, mood stabilizers and antipsychotic medications are gonna be our first line agents because we want to be really careful and not risk uh, inducing or exacerbating mania or hypomania. On the other side, we have depression. And depression, again, is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom. It's a symptom that perhaps is linked to behaviors. It's one of the most prevalent symptoms in psychiatry, let alone primary care diagnoses. Most depression is not treated by psychiatrists, right? It's treated by primary care physicians in, in offices all over. Uh, mood disturbances, however, we recall are common across multiple psychiatric diagnoses. So they're common in major depressive disorder, dysthymic disorder, trauma disorders, schizophrenia spectrum disorders, disruptive behavior disorders, anxiety, and bipolar. So you can see again here, knowing that a patient is depressed doesn't necessarily mean that they have an antidepressant deficiency per se, but it might mean that something is going on in one of those systems that we might be able to intervene. So if we look at the underlying neurobiology of depression, again, it won't surprise you at this point that we do see links in dysregulation of serotonergic, dopaminergic, and noradrenergic function but one of the things that's interesting is that we also see neuroendocrine abnormalities with the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal or the HPA axis that can imply some dysfunction perhaps in glucocorticoids or corticotropin releasing factor. Depression is often associated with inflammation. People who have inflammatory disorders tend to get depressed and people who are depressed tend to have elevated levels of inflammatory cytokines. We see anatomical associations with dysfunction perhaps in the frontotemporal, hypothalamic and amygdala areas and there's genetic factors, as well as possible environmental factors or non-genetic factors, including trauma, neglect, a post-infectious process. Again, we see the similarities and as they are linked between neurobiology of irritability and aggression. So I want you to think about these things where if a patient does have depression or if they have irritability or if they have impulsivity, we should be screening for the other, the other components because these are very common things that do tend to overlap. In terms of the pharmacotherapy for depression, in the absence of a bipolar syndrome, treatment might include SSRIs, it might include SNRIs. Here are some of the names of different medications that we use. Uh, there's also bupropion. Now, this is one of my favorite things to ask my med students about the mechanism because it is totally different than the antidepressants. It's really not serotonergic at all, but it tends to be a great option for regulating dopamine and norepinephrine systems because essentially it is a dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. Again, a highlight is the unique mechanism of bupropion. This is important for patients with history perhaps of concentration issues or disruptive behavior issues that don't have anxiety symptoms, eating disorders, alcohol use disorders, or seizure disorder. There are some cases of bupropion lowering the seizure threshold, so we wanna be careful with that. 
And one way to kind of conceptualize this is why is this helpful in concentration or disruptive behavior? Because if we look at our stimulants, what do they do? They modulate dopamine and norepinephrine by providing additional uh, stimulation in those areas. What this does is it helps to maintain that neurotransmitter in the synapse so that it functions longer. In some of my patients, we do use off-label bupropion for, um, for uh, 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 patients with mood symptoms as well as attention symptoms. Now, let's take a look at some clinical vignettes to apply some of what we've been talking about. Let's talk first about Dario. So Dario is 13 came to your office with his grandmother for outpatient psychiatric evaluation. Dario's been struggling in school, often forgetting to turn in assignments, or maybe he even lost them. Maybe the dog ate him. His teachers have complained about his easy distractibility, mistakes and assignments, difficulty with organization, and interrupting conversations and activities. His grandmother says that Dario has always been like this. Since he was a young boy, he could never sit still or wait his turn. What does Dario have? If you said ADHD, you're probably on the right track. A reminder that some of the things that we might use to diagnose uh, or to assist with our diagnosis are the Vanderbilt ADHD Diagnostic Parent and Teacher Rating Scales. I have both of those pictured here. These are readily available on the web. They're open source in the sense that we can use them. There's no specific copyright. And they're really nice because they do talk about the inattentive symptoms, the impulsive symptoms that, that Dario has, but they also get into factors of mood and irritability. Now, if you've looked at these and said, why are they asking about this? This is an ADHD scale. I'm here to remind you that those uh, syndromes or these behaviors are highly comorbid. Why are they comorbid? Why do patients with ADHD also sometimes have mood uh, irregularities? It should make sense now when we look at the underlying neurobiology and the symptoms or systems that are affecting. So how would we go ahead and treat Dario? Well, we might use stimulants. That's a first line treatment, right? Even though they're difficult and sometimes annoying to prescribe with uh, needing to write a new prescription every month uh, in most jurisdictions and uh, getting calls from the pharmacy, the stimulants are still first line and sometimes actually better tolerated than the non-stimulants, such as bupropion. Remember, we spoke about the mechanism of bupropion being a norepinephrine dopamine reuptake inhibitor or adamoxetine, which is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, also known as Stratera. So let's say that we go ahead and we uh, allow Dario to start a stimulant treatment. In terms of outcomes, we notice he has improvements really right away because stimulants do work very quickly. He has those improvements in attention as well as hyperactivity and impulsivity within the first week of medication administration, as noted by his family and teachers. If we were to prescribe bupropion or adamoxetine, remembering that both of those use more reuptake inhibitor mechanisms, those are going to take a little bit longer, usually to notice an effect. Usually what I explain to patients is the medication is going to start working for you right away. It's one of the things that's going to start making measure, uh, changes, and you might notice that possibly even through side effects. It's going to start exerting its effects, but it will continue to improve an effect as we'd expect within the first several weeks. We can schedule Dario for follow-up in the first couple weeks. And if Dario had depressive symptoms, we might consider something like bupropion. Remember, bupropion is a nice agent for depressive symptoms as well as those who suffer with concentration issues. Adamoxetine, however, is not very effective for depressive symptoms, but it can be effective for attention symptoms. So thanks for helping me diagnose Dario. Let's talk about Wilson. So Wilson is a 12-year-old boy who was brought into the emergency department from his school after screaming at an adult hall monitor, and there was no identified provocation. It just happened. Wilson's mother says that he has been super irritable for the past week. She's concerned that his new friends might be a bad influence. Wilson's been staying out late. He's chatty. He can't concentrate on schoolwork. He's been completing, I'm sorry, he has not been completing chores, and his judgment is in the tank. It's terrible. Wilson is arguing with his mother, saying that there's been fighting with the other boys, and they're not his friends. Wilson's never been drugs, done drugs before, but he actually tried cigarettes for the first time a few days ago. His urine drug screen is currently negative. What does Wilson have? If you said that this was a manic or perhaps a hypomanic episode, 
you're probably right. This has been going on a week. He's got an irritable mood, increased speech, decreased need for sleep, and excessive involvement in high risk or pleasurable activities. So he probably does meet criteria for a manic episode. Now, how are we gonna treat him? Interestingly, in adolescence, usually first line we'll, we'll be using an antipsychotic, usually a second generation antipsychotic, specifically to avoid the risk of extrapyramidal symptoms, QTC prolongation, and neuroleptic malignant syndrome that's more common with our typical or first line antipsychotics, or I should say our first generation antipsychotics. We may do that with or without a mood stabilizer. In children and adolescents, it's actually very common to just use an atypical or second generation antipsychotic due to the rapid onset of action as well as the relatively tolerable side effect profile. In this case, again, because we do have a concern for mania, we do want to remember a contraindication. Although Wilson is irritable and he's had mood disturbances, we don't want to use antidepressants because these can predispose or exacerbate mania. Now, for our next section, we're going to be taking a look specifically at a medication review and running through some of the different classes. Specifically, we're going to be talking about uh, SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. We'll be talking about our Serotonin Norepinephrine Reuptake Inhibitors, or SNRIs. We'll be talking about atypical antidepressants, such as bupropion and mirtazapine. Our tricyclic antidepressants, not that we really ever use those in adolescents, but they still do show up on board exams, so they're worth bringing up. And perhaps similar for the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. Very rare to use these in general these days, uh, especially in children and adolescents. So for our SSRIs, the mechanism of action, and we start here because this is really, in some ways, uh, the most simple of the classes, is that they inhibit serotonin reuptake at the somatodendritic synapse of serotonergic neurons. Specifically, what that results in is more, uh, more 5-hydroxytryptophan or more uh, serotonin in the synapse that then is able to, uh, to bind to the postsynaptic cell. Dosing is going to depend specifically on the SSRI. In terms of side effects, I think one of the most important things to highlight here that we'll talk a little about a little bit more on the on uh, future slides is the black box warning. Specifically, that for if you are prescribing SSRIs in the United States, it is good uh, protocol to make sure to discuss the black box warning that these may increase suicidal thoughts in adolescents. Now, I, how do I discuss that with patients and their families? I do mention that for a child perhaps who has uh, more melancholic depression, for somebody who's kind of not uh, in more almost a not a vegetative state but one where they're severely depressed and not moving SSRIs can be a little bit activating it can make somebody uh, have more thoughts just in general so if there's somebody who has a predisposition towards suicide or self-harm it is something that we want to pay attention to however that said when we looked at the studies from which this black box warning came there was no significant increase in actual uh, suicide attempts or suicidal behavior just the ability to perhaps think a little bit more about those stressful things, especially initially. So that is something that we do want to make sure to screen our adolescents for and, and talk with them about as we are prescribing these medications. Now, uh, additional side effects can include, uh, <laughs> can of course include um, loss of libido or sexual dysfunction, which adolescents sometimes will complain about and often won't complain about unless you ask them. So that's something that can be very important and can be involved with non-adherence. They can also have um, uh, effects on perhaps weight gain, headaches, some systemic effects similar to that, uh, that general, uh, those general areas. We also have to remember toxicities, right? With serotonin, with any serotonergic agent, we are of course concerned about serotonin syndrome. So we'd be looking for alter mental status, perhaps neuromuscular concerns such as uh, clonus. We did talk about the black box warning specific to adolescents, important to know about, important to document. And we do notice that there are some FDA approvals. Um, and I'm cautious in saying too much about the FDA approvals because the reality with FDA approvals uh, is that we use a ton of medications in child psychiatry and we primarily use them off label if we are using them. Uh, they've demonstrated their effect in adults 
Um, but one of the, the bases for these is in the studies, it is considered uh, an ethical challenge to enroll symptomatic adolescents into a study where they might be getting a placebo and might not potentially be, be getting better. So we do, of course, have a number of different studies that do look at the effect of these medications, but a limited number of FDA approvals specifically. The SNRIs add a noradrenergic component to our SSRIs. So think of them as an SSRI plus a NRI to make an SNRI. We talked about uh, venlafaxine or Effexor, which was uh, really kind of the prototype, the gold standard SNRI. Now, of course, we have desvenlafaxine, we have uh, orprostique, we have duloxetine or Cymbalta. These can be effective in those with uh, neuropathic pain as well as mood or anxiety uh, symptoms. Because of that extra noradrenergic uh, effect, we do need to be mindful of changes in vital signs, such as hypertension or increased pulse. We also do pay attention similarly to the SSRIs to suicidal ideation, and we keep an eye out for uh, GI upset. Toxicity overall is rare, um, but there is some concern of overdose uh, leading to QTC prolongation or seizures. With both the SSRIs and SNRIs, one of the nice things about them is there's no real lab monitoring that, uh, that we do regularly. Now, SNRIs are only approved in general for, gen for generalized anxiety disorder in children and adolescents, but not depression. However, we certainly do use them much as we use uh, our SSRIs um, off-label as well. Bupropion we spoke about a little bit already. We'll remember that bupropion has a unique mechanism and that it is a norepinephrine and dopamine reuptake inhibitor. Um, and it uh, helps to prevent the reuptake into the presynaptic neurons, resulting in the neurotransmitters lingering in that synapse a little bit longer, perhaps stimulating post-synaptic receptors. There's some dosing information here on bupropion. The main thing with this one is even though we do sometimes dose, especially our SSRIs, uh, to higher levels, children and adolescents can have very rapid metabolisms. So sometimes they do require higher doses than adults. With bupropion, we really tend to be more careful with that especially because of the decreased seizure threshold that may occur with it, or in patients with bulimia nervosa, again, largely due to their increased seizure threshold due to electrolyte abnormalities. I also pay attention to see if the patient is going to have headaches, uh, abnormal dreams, or if they're using alcohol, as all of those may be additional risks for why this medication may not be a good fit. Because this is a medication that does work on dopamine, we tend to monitor for extrapyramidal effects, similar to our antipsychotic medications. It can cause delirium, hallucinations, cardiac failure, things that we associate with too much dopamine. So we, we're not um, doing formal evaluations for abnormal movements, such as we would with antipsychotics, but it is something that we want to keep in mind. Now, bupropion is approved for uh, depression in adults, but not children or adolescents. That said, we certainly do use it, again, with the advisement that it is an off-label use, although a very common one. This is also approved for smoking cessation. So if we go back to Wilson, even though he just started trying cigarettes, if smoking for him were more of a problem, then we would perhaps consider bupropion to be a, a better option for him. Now, mirtazapine is kind of an unsung hero in a lot of different ways uh, in the world of psychiatry in the sense that it is a selective antagonist at alpha-2 receptors, which in turn increases the release of norepinephrine and serotonin. Uh, dosing is sometimes paradoxical. Sometimes lower doses are associated with uh, more increased appetite or more sedation, but this is a really nice medication for patients who are having trouble sleeping or who have a decreased appetite. I notice in particular with my adolescents who uh, have started experimenting with cannabinoids and they really like CBD or THC, this is a medication that can perhaps provide some of those uh, same perceived benefits in a little bit more of a predictable uh, and quality controlled way. Now we do monitor for neutropenia and agranulocytosis, which really can occur with any of the medications, but it's more of an issue uh, perhaps in some of the literature with uh, mirtazapine. It's not something that I've really worried about in my practice in my career. I've maybe had one or two patients who have had uh, a, pro a possible issue of this, but it is something that we, we pay attention to. You might consider a lipid panel, again, because of the increased appetite, as well as CBC monitoring. Again, not absolutely necessary, but something to think about. Now, 
looking at FDA approvals, we have to remember that it has uh, approvals similar to previous medications in adults only, but you know we do use it in children as well. There's just perhaps not enough of a market or perhaps the ethical challenges that we mentioned with uh, having a placebo group and treating adolescent depression. Now the tricyclic antidepressants are interesting in the sense that they show up far more frequently on exams than they do these days in clinical practice for children. Many of us use them for adults because of their benefits for neuropathic pain, headaches, a number of different things. Um, but one way to think about them is they're really kind of, kind of sloppy drugs. They impact many signaling cascades, including serotonergic, norepinephrine, histaminergic, alpha-adrenergic, cholinergic. It's one of the reasons why they have so many side effects. One of the challenges and the reasons why we really don't prescribe these, especially if there's the slightest hint of suicidal thoughts, is that there's a really narrow therapeutic window. What that means, of course, is that the effective dose is relatively close to the lethal dose if we're not careful. These medications also do best when you check labs with them. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. And we do worry about side effects ranging from drowsiness to cognitive dysfunction from the histaminergic and cholinergic effects to cardiotoxicity and arrhythmias. Really a medication to be careful with, uh, especially if prescribed with any other serotonergic, uh, noradrenergic, or anticholinergic medication. As I mentioned, they have a very narrow therapeutic dose where the lethal dose is about three times the maximum therapeutic dose. So we really need to be careful with that. And the most concerning toxic effects are going to be cardiotoxicity and QTC prolongation. We can measure plasma levels of these, which is pretty great to see if you're in the effective dosing range. And EKG monitoring is also recommended. Now, these medications are really don't have significant FDA approvals in children. But we do use clomipramine for uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and imipramine potentially for enuresis. Uh, for, again, primarily due to those anticholinergic effects. I'm careful with these. These are medications where uh, if you're at all uncomfortable with this, this is where I say uh, not a bad time to refer to a psychiatrist to, to take a closer look at it. Now with the monoamine oxidase inhibitors, the MAOIs, we have to remember that monoamine oxidase is an endogenous enzyme that normally breaks down dopamine, serotonin, epinephrine, and norepinephrine, or the uh, monoamines that would normally be oxidized by monoamine oxidase. By inhibiting that enzyme, you end up with an increased amount of these, uh, these neurotransmitters, again, that linger in the synapse and might have the ability to exert their various effects. Now, one of the challenges, again, at least on board exams, more so than in real life, is that these do have dietary interactions with pyramine-containing foods, uh, aged foods, cheese, wine, aged meats. And when those foods are given, it can result in a hypertensive crisis. These medications can also be implicated or problematic in the case of serotonin syndrome, something we need to look out for. We spoke about the dietary restriction with tyramine, and perhaps not surprisingly, as these are very old medications, there are no FDA-approved indications for children and adolescents. I do have a quick image here on, uh, from American Family Physician reviewing autonomic, neurologic, musculoskeletal, gastrointestinal symptoms of serotonin syndrome. The way that I primarily see this on, um, uh, on exams and, and possibly even <laughs> the way that I write questions about this uh, is I like these hunter's criteria that are on the bottom left, talking about spontaneous clonus, uh, tremor, hyperreflexia, high temperature, um, and then ocular or inducible clonus. So uh, something really interesting to, to think of, to be aware of. Um, and this clonus is different than the rigidity that you might see with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, which does present very similarly. So you're gonna look for histories of what diagnosis the patient had, as well as what potential treatments they, they might have had to have gotten uh, those, those disorders. Now, I did mention earlier our second generation antipsychotics and our mood stabilizers. Now, I feel like these are medications that you should know exist, but in my experience, most, certainly not all, but most, primary care physicians are less comfortable prescribing our second generation antipsychotics and our mood stabilizers. Um, they're uh, a little bit more specialized. There's a little bit more monitoring. If I had to pick one, it would usually be aripiprazole or Abilify. 
for uh, any time that we might need an antipsychotic medication, again, for mood stabilization, could be used for, uh, for different forms of impulsivity if not related to ADHD. We don't want to combine the dopamine uh, blockade or something competing with dopamine, dopamine where we're also trying to increase dopamine, right? So we wouldn't combine aripiprazole with a stimulant, certainly, if we, although I've, I've seen it, it's not, not the best practice. Um, aripiprazole has easy dosing, good tolerability, maybe a little bit less extrapyramidal symptoms than, uh, than other medications, certainly more less than our uh, first generation or typical antipsychotics. Certainly less metabolic side effects, which is nice. Risperidone is worth noting as well. Uh, we use that often for rigid behaviors and autism spectrum disorder. And then with mood stabilizers, again, we want to be, unless this is something you're comfortable with, get help from a psychiatrist. Don't necessarily start here because each of the mood stabilizers is often associated with some type of end organ damage, something that needs additional monitoring. Uh, at least make sure that you have a psychiatrist in your network if this is something you're uncomfortable with that you can reach out to and, and talk to about the dosing. Now, for your reference, I included these slides where we do have some information on uh, indications and dosages for, for use in pediatric patients. Uh, again, with clomipramine, duloxetine, escitalopram, fluoxetine, um, some of the, the different indications. It's a lot to keep track of. And honestly, even as somebody who treats these things, I don't think a ton about on-label or off-label use of the medications because so much of child and adolescent psychiatry, again, is, is off-label. It's something to be aware of, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I start with the on-label medication because perhaps sometimes the off-label medication might be more commonly used. Continuing, here's just some information on the different medications and their, uh, their relative doses and other information. Primarily, here is a reference for you. Likewise, I included this chart again as a reference if you want to, <laughs> if this is something you're uncomfortable with, you need to print out just three slides, kind of these, <laughs> the, these last three slides might be it. Talks about starting dose, typical dose, FDA indications, uh, and in particular, the adult doses, which honestly, for these types of medications, even though in pediatrics, we dose a lot of things by weight, in, in general, for adolescents in particular, they tend to tolerate adult doses for most things and they might need actually higher doses because of their rapid metabolism. So just some things to think about. I also really liked uh, this chart that looked at uh, medication options for PTSD in children. Um, you'll see here that it includes a lot of different things that uh, can regulate some of the hyper, uh, the hyper arousal symptoms, the re-experiencing symptoms, different ways that we address them. These are, um, all things that I have personally used to treat different symptoms. But again, this is showing you the wide world of psychiatry. If there's something on here that feels a little bit unfamiliar or uncomfortable, I do feel like this is above and beyond what would be expected for most uh, pediatricians or most primary care physicians um, who are treating this population. Now, we are, of course, at an osteopathic conference. So I do want to, uh, to talk with you about going back to our roots a little bit. I'm, I'm a graduate from Kirksville. I actually did my, my rotations here in Arizona. And I think that there's value in looking at structure function relationships. I know we dove into the brain. We took a look at what's going on in the synapse. But we also have to remember that so much of anxiety is related perhaps to sympathetic overactivation. We have to remember that sleep disturbances might be related to hypoactive function of the parasympathetic symptom, system, right? Uh, pain, mobility, loss of function, these are all things that we might consider. Now, is doing counter strain or balanced ligamentous tension going to be uh, anywhere near standard of care for treating these, uh, these symptoms or disorders? Probably not, but it is something that you can think about in terms of perhaps relaxation, coping mechanisms, different things that you can teach uh, an adolescent um, and or their family to assist with. Going back to our session learning objectives, uh, we took a look at definitions of irritability, impulsivity, and depression. We talked about some of the common diagnoses that are associated with these different symptoms. We took a look at neurobiology, even just a very simplistic view to help uh, explain this, to show it to children, to adolescents, to their parents, and say, you know, hey, this is, this is what might be going on, and this is why we're going to treat it this way. 
we took a look at different treatment approaches for those specific clinical syndromes, and we applied them in clinical vignettes. Finally, we took a look at the mechanisms of action, dosing, adverse effects, toxicity, lab tests, and some of the FDA approvals. Excuse me. I thank you for joining me for this uh, recording of this presentation of impulsivity, irritability, and depression in adolescence. This presentation specifically has been prepared for the Tucson Osteopathic Medical Foundation, and I'm Dr. Jonathan Terry, uh, and I'm currently an assistant dean at California Health Sciences University in Clovis, California. Thank you for your wonderful attention. I hope you have a great rest of your day.